Hi everyone, welcome to the next Hangout with Art as part of the um, Milwaukee Art Museum's online course, Hangout with Art. We are so excited that you've tuned in today. Uh, welcome everyone watching. We have two really great speakers uh, this afternoon um, to talk about art and culture. Um, before we dive into our conversation, uh, just a couple of housekeeping and general information about this online course. Um, so this course is uh, a MOOC, a massive open online course that we've been running for a few months now here at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And the goal is to get participants uh, feeling more comfortable looking at art and going to museums. Um, and we've been completing different activities, both online on the Google Art Project as well as in local museums. Um, and we've now moved into the second part of our course which features live conversations with uh, experts in the field who are not necessarily folks who work at museums, but who use art in their daily practice. So we're really excited to highlight uh, different themes related to art uh, and work. So today, again, we're talking about art and culture um, with Adam Carr and Anwar Floyd Pruitt, who are down there below. You can see them. Um, and we'll turn it over to them in just a sec. Uh, but just so you all know who are watching, we want this to be as conversational as possible. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, Anwar and Adam will talk a bit about what they do in a moment. Um, but if you hover over your screen and click on the Q&A button, you will be able to ask questions. Um, for our speakers, which we'll answer. And you can also uh, vote for questions that you'd like to see answered by clicking the plus one button when you see a question pop up. So please feel free to ask as many questions as you like, and we will dig into them. Um, and before we start, I also want to thank uh, our partner, the Google Art Project, as well as our funder, the Google Jumpstart Your Course Grant, um, which helped make this project possible. So um, let's get started. Uh, quickly to introduce our speakers today, we have Anwar Floyd Pruitt, um, who has worked for a number of local uh, youth-serving organizations here in Milwaukee, including Express Yourself, Artworks for Milwaukee, Arts at Large, and he's also part of the Programming Committee for Artists Working in Education. Um, and he's facilitated art making with youth um, in various uh, settings, uh, the juvenile justice system, Milwaukee Public Schools or MPS, um, the LGBT Community Center here in Milwaukee, as well as the uh, Milwaukee County Park System. Uh, Anwar holds a bachelor's degree in psychology uh, from Harvard University, and he's currently uh, pursuing um, a sculpture and digital technology degree from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So we're excited to have Anwar join us. Uh, we're also joined by Adam Carr, who is an independent storyteller, writer, and media producer here in Milwaukee. Um, he works on many different projects, uh, but to name just a few, um, he's currently working with Sharp Literacy to write a children's book about exploring Milwaukee. Um, and he's collaborated on a number of public art projects, including uh, ones with uh, artist Sonia Thompson, as well as Reginald Baylor, who was actually a guest um, here in our series of Hangouts with Art uh, recently, which you can watch on our Google Plus page or our YouTube page. Uh, and Adam was also a producer at 88.9 Radio Milwaukee uh, from 2008 to 2011. Uh, and since then, he's collaborated with uh, lots of neighborhood groups um, in Milwaukee, uh, including the Milwaukee Neighborhood News Service, Radio Reagan at Reagan High School, and many more. So I'm sure we will hear a lot about these projects from our speakers. So to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to Anwar to tell us a little bit about his work. Anwar. Hi, and thanks for uh, having me. This is such a cool opportunity. Uh, we can go ahead and put up the first slide of uh, some of my work, but I tend to, well, I think I make beautiful things, I think I make interesting things, and I think I make, you know, things uh, with a social commentary. And when I'm really doing my best work, I'm doing all three. Uh, this piece right here is called Black Pain Trio, and it was actually hanging in the Milwaukee Art Museum, not last summer, but the summer before, uh, part of an exhibition called Wisconsin 30, which was a partner exhibition with 30 Americans. Um, Black Pain Trio is, to me, essentially a call to action for uh, the black community to address the problems with uh, 
in a healthy and sustainable way. So uh, a lot of my work is abstract. Uh, some people look at this and didn't necessarily see um, eyes crying. Uh, some people saw each of those um, sort of circular pieces at the top as a head and that this was like actually six people walking. And that's one of the cool things about art in general is that people always see or can see different things uh, in the same work of art. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, as Chelsea mentioned, I am pursuing my second undergraduate degree at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. This is a piece that I made uh, in my first year program, just called uh, Bucket Baroque, and it was inspired by work by an artist named Sarah Z, who takes common household items and uh, rearranges them into these interesting compositions and photographs them. And, uh, you know, my brother, Mikal, is an artist as well, and his hand is also in this piece. Uh, he took this uh, freezer rack, I just pointed at it, but I guess you can't see where I'm pointing, and attached a whole bunch of uh, clothespins to it, and, uh, you know, sort of like left it out for me, and it just worked out to be, you know, sort of like an essential element for this piece. Uh, next. So uh, I've done work with Express Yourself Milwaukee. It's a therapeutic-based uh, art nonprofit that works with youth. And what we're looking at right here are pictures of our pop-up gallery that went up uh, last summer, I believe. And we ended up winning an award uh, from the mayor's office for, uh, for public works. And, you know, some of these panels were created in the Juvenile Detention Center, as mentioned, some of them uh, at different schools, some of them in the Express Yourself Milwaukee studio on uh, 34th and Lisbon Avenue. Next. This is a sculptural piece also from uh, my time at University uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, it's called Homegoing, and it was interesting. When I made it, I was sort of uh, torn between whether it was a sort of a wedding, cent wedding center piece or whether it was a funerary wreath. But I thought the name homegoing, you know, was really appropriate for either of those uh, situations. But, you know, really it is about uh, a celebration. And people don't usually think of funerals as celebrations, but I guess I see them as a, a celebration of life. Next. This is actually the uh, mo a still frame from uh, one of my most recent pieces. It's called Human. And uh, two friends of mine at school uh, took wads of paper, covered them in gesso. Uh, you know, gesso is sort of like a white paint-like substance that painters use to um, prime a canvas before they paint on it. And then they threw them at me. So it's a about a minute long video, but on each of those black pieces of paper that was covered in gesso, uh, there's written, I guess, racial slurs, ethnic slurs, uh, homophobic slurs, those sorts of things. And the piece for me was really about um, standing up for everyone's rights, not just my own. And yep, there's a uh, there's a wider shot. So as you can see, I'm almost completely covered in gesso and. It took <laughs> uh, it took me like a half an hour to get all of that gesso like out of my chest hair, um, but it's uh, so you know I think it's a, a stunning image and I think the video is powerful, but uh, it's also you know has a lot of meaning and I think you know I was really sort of inspired by that quote from the Macklemore song um, about gay marriage that just said you know no freedom until we're all equal. Next. And that's me at uh, the Hyde House uh, on Milwaukee's south side next to a, uh, a kinetic sculpture that I made uh, out of real dollar bills, wood, and a motor that lifts that jaw up and down. It's a not so, well, maybe for me, it's a not so subtle uh, criticism of uh, America at least in America, driven by capitalism. And yes, that's real money. I actually died 
the dollar bills red uh, dyed some dollar bills blue, and then all of those stars are also made from actual dollar bills. So there's probably about $150 in cash on that piece. And I'm wearing an I Am Milwaukee t-shirt that, uh, that my brother made. Next. So this piece right here, and if you want to flip to the next slide as well and sort of uh, maybe back and forth slowly, uh, this is a detail of a sculpture I made uh, earlier this year. And this, I see this as sort of a study for uh, a community art piece that I'd like to uh, engage in. Most of the pieces of wood that you see here, and if you could flip to the next slide, uh, most, of the pic most of the pieces of wood you see here are salvaged. Uh, I found them dumpster diving. Um, I, I'll be honest, I did get some pieces from the Goodwill, but I had a rule that I would not pay over 50 cents for any piece of wood. And I, um, you know, I collected all this wood, processed it by, you know, cutting it through, um, you know, the band saw, the table saw, that sort of thing, and then, you know, created compositions on rectangles and hung them all on the wall. So this is about 20 feet tall, and you know, what the piece is about for me is really, you know, taking things that are thrown away and then using them to uh, make something beautiful, uh, you know, I guess, like, sort of repurpose them. I almost see it as a metaphor for, um, I don't know, some neighborhoods or some people that I would say aren't necessarily given the respect or held in the esteem that they deserve. And so I'd like to go to neighborhoods uh, that have like a high floor closure rate and that sort of thing and work with the community to stage some community cleanups, uh, collect trash, but also collect the wood, process the wood, and then bring it back to that community to work with community members to build um, sculptures like this uh, that can you know, be somewhere in the neighborhood. And next. And so that's me working with some youth in the Amani neighborhood last summer on a project called Painting with Purpose. Uh, that was a partnership between the city of Milwaukee and Artworks for Milwaukee. And we created, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, alternative board ups to the green boards that you'll find on many foreclosed homes. And so if you flip to the next picture, I believe you can actually see a, a house with the alternative board up. So usually all those uh, doors and windows we covered with green boards and instead we covered them with uh, you know, wood with stencils on them that the youth uh, in the neighborhood helped create. And uh, you know, that was just a, a great experience and just engaging youth in the community and neighbors in the neighborhood uh, you know, said that it, the houses absolutely uh, looked better than they did before. Uh, it was a great project, and you know, some of the adults in the neighborhood did bring up the concern that this project was sort of a band-aid, and that it's not necessarily addressing the true concerns of these neighborhoods uh, in terms of like lack of employment and um, the foreclosure crisis. But they also could agree that it was great to have something for children to do during the summer, uh, something structured, working with you know, uh, adults and local artists to, uh, you know, do something positive. So I worked with um, Videl Hill, uh, another local artist who was in the Wisconsin 30 uh, show at the Milwaukee Art Museum on this project. And next. This is actually the earliest piece that I, um, in this slideshow, I made this when I was still living in New York. And as an artist, I grew up always feeling uh, a little bad that I couldn't draw particularly well. And I've taken drawing one and drawing two, and I can draw something that looks the way it's supposed to look. But I'm really into abstract art, and these pieces right here uh, were highly influenced by Matisse and his gouache cutouts. And so this piece is still hanging in the living room of one of my good friends in New York City even like five years later. 
except that piece on the bottom left looks like it's about to fall off. <laughs> Next. This is a detail from a piece called uh, the Tower of Babel that I made recently. And uh, next, this is a, a wider shot of it. And again, this piece is a uh, sort of a commentary on um, communication and you know, made me think about how even in this technological age, uh, I can get a direct translation from anyone anywhere in the world but that even if I understand the words coming out of their mouth or that they're writing, I really might not understand them or uh, the, their context. So, um, yeah, so this is sort of a, a critique of that and, of course, is a reference to the, uh, the biblical story about the Tower of Babel. And this is made from uh, plaster cast telephones uh, and telephone, uh, telephone wires. Next. So this, and uh, you can click to the next one as well, but that's a detail from this untitled piece, um, which was inspired by a work called Sky Fence at the uh, Linden Sculpture Garden on the uh, sort of furthest north side of Milwaukee, or that might already even be into uh, brown deer or something like that. Uh, it's com comprised of wood. Uh, the material that I started with was two by fours, and you know, just through a number of processes, you know, I guess one made it look less like two by fours, but also just learning how to use wood, which is a very stubborn, uh, stubborn material. And I made this at UW Milwaukee as well. And next. Nope, no next. Well, that's probably the last of the slides. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, continuing the conversation. And Great. Thank you so much, Anwar. And actually, if we could bring up that the slide, kind of the pop-up gallery one more time. We did have one question from Gerard about um, the bluebirds in that image and if they were actual birds or if they were also part of the installation. Sure. So, yeah, those birds are part of the installation. Um, we, I believe we had youth create the images of the birds that we then traced and cut out of wood. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, let's turn it over to Adam before we kind of dive into conversation. And Adam, if you can take it away and tell us a bit about your work. Yeah. First, thank you to the Milwaukee Air Museum. Thank you to Chelsea. I'm a fan of yours. You're good at what you do. And Anwar, I'm a fan of yours. I think you probably know that, but I like your work a lot. So let's see the first slide. My, can you guys see it? I'm not seeing it. He's bringing it up. There we go. Okay, good. So actually, before the first slide comes up, I might as well just introduce myself. Um, so I don't consider myself an artist. Um, I don't have the training in it. I majored in math and philosophy in college. Um, I've done a lot of work with art, with artists. Um, I think of myself, I guess, maybe more apt to think of myself as a cultural producer, or a cultural field worker, or something that sort of defies, um, I guess I'm sort of undisciplined sometimes, and maybe um, overtly defiant of categorization, which I think is a pretty common thing, a lot of people are that way, but um, I guess I just let my interest in community, in communication, in people, places, and stories sort of guide my work, um, and it takes me in a lot of different directions. So why don't we start with the first slide. Okay, so... I'm just going to take you through a few projects that I've worked worked on recently. I kind of always have multiple projects in the air at once, but I'm going to describe the um, larger projects in the last few years that I've been working on. So um, this is a project named Listening to Mitchell that I did uh, last year. It was actually kind of, it finished last year, and it had been about an 18-month build-up to it, and then a sort of six-month six month installation period. So it was about a two-year project. I did it with an artist uh, and photographer named Sonia Thompson, who's also based in Milwaukee. And um, what you're seeing here in this slide is we had an empty storefront where we had an 18-speaker sound installation. Um, the sounds that were involved in that installation that was sort of randomized and spatialized had been taken from the 18 months of interviews that we'd done 
for the project. Um, those interviewees had all had some relationship to Mitchell Street, which is a great main street on the south side of Milwaukee that has been and always has been home to first wave immigrants in Milwaukee. So kind of going, it, it, tracing Milwaukee's history, Polish, a lot of Polish and German, Indian, Greek, uh, sorry, Italian, Greek, then a lot of Mexican immigrants, South American immigrants, uh, now a lot of Northern African, Middle Eastern, South Asian, Southeast Asian. Um, there's actually now a current wave onto the street of a lot of African American folks on the north side of Milwaukee. So it's a place where there's just all these different layers of cultures, these different layers of history, of peoples. Um, so we did interviews with folks about, you know, the whole span of the street from the 20s as much as people could remember to the, the contemporary. And we took, recorded those interviews and made a sound installation inside where the idea was in a lot of it, folks are speaking over each other and they can't actually hear each other. Everyone has something really strong to say. They have some history they want to privilege and put in the foreground but oftentimes they, they sort of tangled with each other and made each other inaudible, I guess almost because of the force of their own sentiment and reality. So this was the audio, uh, an audio installation. You can see on the back of the wall there, um, there are pictures of um, different objects, those bright pictures. Next slide. So the installation itself uh, was on seven city blocks, so in addition to the storefront, we also had uh, seven blocks of images this is, uh, we had the marquee at the Majeska Theater with the project's name on it. Uh, next slide. This is at the east end of the installation. Some of them kind of resemble more like wheat paste than, um, but they're all photographic murals. Uh, next slide. Ranging from some that were about poster size or even smaller than that to these are about 20 feet wide and about, I think they're about 7 feet tall. Um, that's a series of installations we had on the, the west end, so that was on the west end of the seven blocks. Next slide. And we had uh, images like this throughout the um, throughout the corridor that sort of, you know, it's a big corridor with lots of historic buildings on it and um, we just tried to inject little bits and pieces of these little fragments of narratives. We provided a phone number to call and when someone called those on their phone um, we'd produce some audio pieces that would play that would sort of relate to the themes in the images. So next slide. Um, this is the exterior. You can see these two purple s signs there. Um, there's sort of unspooled cassette tapes there um, on those signs, the purple one. And then inside, next slide, is again the audio installation. So that was about a two-year work that we did. Um, I could talk about that for another full, I could talk about that for a full hour. So uh, let's just go to the next slide. Um, Prior to that, I'd done a project named Typeface, Typeface with Reggie Beller. Um, Chelsea mentioned that he was part of this uh, MOOC as well. Um, next slide. We kind of divided our roles in that project. I worked with Reggie, and I was the producer of community conversations. Um, I produced in four different communities, four different kinds of community conversations. I recorded a lot of that language, and then Reggie turned the actual language into artworks. So in the four different neighborhoods we worked in, it was Washington Sherman Park is on the upper left. Um, upper right is Burnham Park. Lower left is Harambe. And lower right is Lindsay Heights. We did everything from uh, spoken word and writing workshops with Dasha Kelly uh, to uh, one of the sites I interviewed 100 people in the street. I just walked around for about a month and interviewed people until I made it to 100. Um, I worked with a church congregation. You can see on the lower left. And then I had some conversations over barbecue um, in the lower right, and really I, I focused on primary questions from the perspective of a community, questions like, why here, who are you, um, and just kind of went from there and followed the breadcrumb trail in each of those conversations and yielded really interesting stuff, which, uh, next slide, I took excerpts of that language, handed it to Reggie, and Reggie made um, these artworks, or the, the physical pieces, which ranged anything from there's a a bookshed in the upper left, there's a series of murals in the upper right, there's a sort of bouquet of flowers in the lower left, and then some benches with questions and statements on them in the lower right. So it's kind of an interesting process where, um, you know, I, I went in and unearthed um, content and, and kind of a, as sincerely um, connotative as I could, uh, you know, get content from people about what was exist, existed in the community and then 
Reggie sort of took them and embodied them in artworks and that were kind of like cartoonish in their appearance, but if you look closely at them, they say, say some really, um, really challenging stuff. I mean, you can even see in the bench in the lower right there, it says, can I stay angry enough to do something about it? Which is a good question to ask yourself. A lot of times you get really angry about, you know, this or that, but then it, it kind of dissipates when it comes to actually moving forward. Okay, so next slide. This is the project that I did, again, with Sonia Thompson in 2012. It was named Here Mothers Are. We work in the Amani neighborhood, a neighborhood that uh, Anwar mentioned. Uh, and we interviewed a series of six mothers, um, kind of six mothers and families, and then other people around um, the Amani neighborhood. We took photographs inside of their homes. We recorded those conversations, which were sort of tangled in family history and relationships and broken relationships. And then we turned that into an installation. So next slide. Um, this, these are some images from that. We had a vacant lot that had, you can see in the upper left, some billboards and planter spaces built. Uh, we installed images from insides of homes, kinds of an inversion of the domestic. It's an interior to the exterior here. Um, and then we had a series of community events there over that summer. Um, there's also, in the lower right, you can see people are pressing a doorbell. And there was a speaker installed there again where audio pieces were played from the installation. So next, I think I'm running out of time. I'm talking too long the first one. And then also adjacent to it, this was sort of a precursor to a project that Anwar mentioned, or just kind of, you know, um, it was in Imani. It was a project done on a boarded house. And I was kind of involved in some of the conversations that led to painting with a purpose and kind of, you know, I collaborate with the artists involved in that as well. Um, uh, next slide. I'll just do a few last ones here. Um, so actually, can you go next, 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 next? Okay, uh, Reggie Baylor and Sonia Thompson have been wonderful collaborators of mine in the past few years on public art projects. These five photos have my current collaborators on a project I'm working on. I'm writing a book for the third grade level with a group named Sharp Literacy that's about exploring Milwaukee. So these are all students from five different schools around the city of Milwaukee. Kluge, Hmong American Pizza Academy, Beam Academy, uh, Forest Home, and St. Anthony's. And the students are, and I, are going through a process of exploring our communities, of digging in, of asking questions of the environment around us that we might not think of asking. So we've all been exploring together. And through this process, I'm going to be writing a book, probably the beginning of the summer, that will be published later this year. And I'm really excited about that. It's really exciting uh, to have to be working on this project and to be writing my first book. All right, next page. Or next. Um, recently, I've just uh, started doing a lot more small projects. I've kind of been doing these big mothership projects, and I've been doing some smaller ones. I did a community design workshop, um, one that was a poster-making workshop where designers and community members made hand-drawn posters about racism, issues of disparity, race, um, and discrimination. That was a wonderful one. Uh, next slide. Oh, well, I messed one up, one slide, but that's okay. Um, I just did another making about, about food, and we made Vine videos, but that's another story. I've been doing bus tours lately, which have been really fun. Um, I've been kind of just worked with a group named New Walkie, as well as I'm on the board of Artists Working in Education. We do them as fundraisers. But um, I've just had free reign to design, mostly free reign to design tours of neighborhoods in Milwaukee. And rather than say... It's really great if you go out and explore neighborhoods, actually get bodies in a bus, take them to experiences, take them to people, take them to... We get off the bus a lot, probably too much. Um, on three, three and a half hour tours, we'll get out as many as 10 times, um, just because I think you can see and experience so much more outside of a bus than in one. Uh, okay, next slide. I think we're getting right to the end. I have another project named Milwaukee Than Now, which is sort of a social media project where I carry a camera with me and I take pictures everywhere I go and um, essentially trying to challenge centralized notions of the city. You know, a lot of people, to, Milwaukee isn't just downtown and iconic architecture. It's, it's a lot more than that, and I'm just trying to kind of creating an alternative visual identity to the city, um, including, next slide, did it make it? Yeah. So sometimes I, I really love the college travel, but sometimes I think we all take ourselves too seriously. And sometimes I'm, like, <laughs> specifically kind of challenging of, you know, our, our city's identity. But I think Kawatrava dude, who can't get behind that? So 
Yeah. I actually, Indeed. I also <laughs> wanted, intentionally, I wanted to put this in this Milwaukee Art Museum conversation just for, so that this is on record. <laughs> it's on record. Excellent. <laughs> Brilliant ending. <laughs> I thought it might get like scrubbed out or like someone from MEM would be like, no, you can't do that. So yeah. good. We're gonna... all about different interpretations of the, uh, of the ar architecture. Um, yeah. I've heard boats, hadn't before heard surfboards, but I'm into it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll bring that up in some tours in the future. So just to start kicking off our conversation, I think in listening to both of you, um, discuss your work, uh, there are two kind of major themes that I think are really similar between the two of you, uh, and I think both are also really connected to this idea of culture, and that's people and place. So both of those things seem so central to your work. Both of you use, um, as kind of to use your words, Adam, use content from people and work closely with people. You're not isolated you know, in your practice um, at all. And place is also really key. So I wonder if you guys could talk a little more about, um, specifically about those two concepts in terms of culture and community in your work. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll, you mind if I go first, Anwar? Go ahead. Um, yeah, to, I, I guess to me, it, it I, I really don't have any formal training in art practice or anything like that, so um, a lot of the work that I do is just, I, I'm really just indulging in my own curiosity. Um, I guess from the experiences that I had growing up, I just had, in a city that's really, you know, in Milwaukee, we talk about our segregation so often, we talk about our division so often. Um, in my childhood and my upbringing in Milwaukee, I just had friends and reasons to be all over the city. Um, the schools I went to, the relationships I had with other family friends and things like that were all over the city of Milwaukee, so I'd always had this really wide range of experiences with people, with places. Um, I had the opportunity to keep going back places and watch them grow and change and evolve. So I guess in some ways, it's not, it's not so much intentional as it is just really um, just the way that I function. I find if I'm not engaging in people and places, if I'm not so I'm kind of digging for more depth and texture of what's already there. I actually get like dis despondent sometimes <laughs> if I'm not really out in the world engaging and conversing with people. So in some ways, I've just sort of sneakily been structuring all my projects around those things. Um, and you know, what a danger of that is always assuming there's nothing there, saying, you know, I'm going to be the person who finds it and claiming some sort of authorship around that. And to me, I've, I, I've always just found that there's so much resilience, there's, wherever people are, there's so much interesting, complex, um, there's just so much complexity that a lot of times, just what I hope to do is just give the public some access to that, especially in places where that might have been written off or, or where there's some sort of reduction of its identity, so. Yeah, you know, for me, art, you know, changed my life, I think, um, you know, coming to terms with the fact that I was an artist, and uh, and I believe that art has this transformative power, and before I went back to UWM to get this uh, second degree in sculpture, I was working for Express Yourself Milwaukee, which is based, uh, you know, in art therapy, and <clears throat> I think that's, like, maybe their tagline or one of their mottos, but, it's, you know, it's about celebrating the transformative power of art, and it did, art did that for me, and I honestly think that it can do it for other people as well. Uh, we normally, you know, with the nonprofits that I work for, it's always working with youth, and it's never too early. As a matter of fact, if, it's, if you don't do it when you're young, then it might be too late even uh, to, you know, really use art. Um, as a learning tool, as a growing tool. Um, you know, my favorite location to work at is the uh, Juvenile Detention Center because these are youth that have essentially, they're not even at risk. These are youth who uh, statistically will end up in the prison, prison system and the recidivism rate is really high. And a lot of them don't, 
necessarily have the confidence in art making nor in other parts of their lives. And so if I can sit down with them and just draw or sculpt or something, um, one, they can see that I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo, but then also it's just like being with them and participating in this art practice gets people to relax, and then we can start having conversations. Uh, so many of the adults in their lives are constantly talking at them or talking down to them, and when we're sitting side by side working on a project, then we can really start, you know, speaking with each other. Um, there was a, and I think, you know, it kind of relates to that Tower of Babel piece that I showed earlier, the one made out of all the, uh, the phones. And what I didn't mention about the piece is that I recorded 15 different languages reading a script that I wrote, which is essentially a phone call um, where it's like really a, uh, a fuzzy connection and they're not communicating. And then that process alone, I'm sure Adam's experienced this, like when you go out and you engage people in helping you create art or having them be co-creators of artwork was so powerful. I spend 99.9% of my time listening to the English language and then to hear you know, um, the Igbo language, to hear a number of Native American languages, uh, Arabic, um, Hebrew. I don't know, it was just like this really powerful experience. And I don't know, it, it, I, it feels great when I'm, you know, playing a role in that. And I, you know, believe that the people that I work with uh, also, you know, have this uh, sort of this great experience and potentially uh, transformative experience. And I think that really brings up a theme that we've been talking about in a lot of these conversations during this online course, which is thinking about um, kind of giving ourselves and others permission to engage with art and opening that door to the possibility of a transformative experience through art making or through looking at art or through being engaged with a community mm -hmm. in some way, which I think is a really... Um, a really powerful thing, but as you said, Anwar, it gets harder and harder to do the older you get. Um, you know, when you're in mm -hmm. elementary school, it's kind of a given that, well, hopefully a given that you have an art class that you can, you know, um, participate in, but to be that kind of free creatively and have those kind of doors open to mm -hmm. tough conversations that art can open um, is really key. Well, to piggyback that, I think, um, I completely agree with that, and I think I mean, in having openness, open an openness to engage with art, with culture, with community, with all those other things. I mean, really, at the basis of that, and it's in part why I think about my my practice being based around empathy. It's about like before you can do any of those things, you have those are all kind of an an engagement with self first in some ways. Being an openness to, I mean, there's a certain vulnerability to having certain kinds of conversations, to allowing yourself to to look at things or to engage in an act of making. Um, that I, I actually was raised by an art therapist. My mother was an art therapist, so I can, you know, I, I had had a really strong connection. Janet Carr, she's worked with the museum in Chelsea a bunch too. Um, but I have always, you know, I was making masks and kind of plumbing the depths of the, my subconscious and unconscious and all these other elements as I was a kid, which were really huge advantages for me, I think, in my life, and that I've always kind of felt comfortable with the murkiness of ourselves, of, of myself, and then kind of being able to relate to that in other people and just, um, so for me a lot of my practice is built, built in listening and, and providing space for other people to express themselves and I think, I mean there is just kind of a certain vulnerability that's involved in kind of entering an art museum, especially where like, you know, I can feel like art history is so calcified and hard and, and grand works of art, art are so like symphonic that me playing my harmonica out of tune might not match the setting. You know what I'm saying? Like I might, the the depths of my emotional reality might be inadequate to standing in front of Guernica. And like, like maybe I'm not as bowled over as, or maybe I'm not as good of a human being as I should be. Um, but you know, you just kind of have to do it, right? Like, you're, we're all deficient human beings in some respects. So. 
And actually, on that note, we have a, a question for you guys about art history and museums um, from yeah. Neil. Hi, Neil. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so Neil asks, um, what does it mean for you to work in collaboration with museums? Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel more connected to art history um, because of that collaboration? And both of you, um, you know, have worked with our museum here, the Milwaukee Art Museum. Uh, so maybe a quick recap of what, you, what you've done and... Um, as you answer that question, it would be great. Sure. Um, well, my uh, brother and I were both included in the Wisconsin 30 exhibition, as I mentioned, and then we both worked as uh, sort of uh, guest docents for the 30 Americans, uh, you know, art exhibition. So, you know, I studied art history in the past couple years as a student, and certainly engaging in art history uh, makes a trip to the museum even that much more um, educational. And sure, there's this really great feeling, and maybe it's because I'm kind of a nerd, like when I look at a painting from the distance and I'm like, oh, I know that artist, even if it's not a painting I studied, or I know that, uh, you know, I know that art movement, or uh, I don't know. I try not to say it out loud too much in case the people I'm with <laughs> aren't as familiar. Um, but, you know, and I think to, uh, to Adam's point, going to museums can be intimidating. Uh, I made a piece earlier this year, which was uh, an abstract piece, and then had people critique it without telling them anything about it. Hope I wanted them not to even know who made it, but uh, time kind of got away from me. And it was difficult to move the piece because it was so large, so it was in the sculpture lab. But, right, I don't want people to be intimidated by art or by going to museums. And I think perhaps, like, making art themselves is a great first step to not being intimidated. Um, but also, you know, if you have that art history basis, then you can go to the piece and you can get out of it what the artist, like, um, maybe really intended uh, at that time and in that, uh, in that context. But I truly believe that a person without that art history knowledge can look at a piece and get something from it that's just as valid, just as important, uh, just as powerful. Here, here, <laughs> says the museum educator. <laughs> Absolutely agree. Adam, did you want to chime in? Sure. Um, I... I... I have kind of a wrought relationship with art sometimes, and I actually, um, if I could go back in time and, you know, study a different thing in my college experience, I actually took a, a bunch of art history classes. I always thought it would be, I, I would like to, to major in it, but, um, sorry, just to, reading the question again. Um, okay, so I guess to bring up something, um, I actually worked in a, in a, pretty collaborative way, which I actually think is relevant to this, this topic of art and culture, with the Milwaukee Art Museum last year. I was a field producer for the, the art museum, did a, commissioned a bunch of magnum photographers who are preeminent, world-famous, great photographers to come to Milwaukee as part of an ongoing project they have named uh, Postcards from America. They've done it in, in, in um, Miami, in Rochester, New York, when Kodak was closing, and they've done a few different... Um, versions of this, and they, they came to Milwaukee, and my job was to, you know, a photographer said when I picked her up at the airport, I need someone to do a handstand in a Speedo in sub-20, minus 20 degree weather and windy, I needed to find her a person, and we actually were able to find her a person by the time we got her to the hotel, that was Alessandra Sanguinetti, but um, I guess that, that actually, you know, working so directly in collaboration with uh, Lisa Sutcliffe, the curator of photography at Milwaukee Art Museum, and then actual photographers were creating work that ended up in the museum. It did. It didn't. I guess what it what it did for me is, in some ways, being on the inside of their processes. A lot of which I'm not even supposed to talk about the the specifics of those processes. But seeing how rigorous and intense and different their processes were from each other, what was consistent across all of those those artists was the the rigor and the intensity of how, and almost like, vor they were voracious as makers when they were going around and taking photos. Um, so that, that in some ways, it made me connect to, to art history in a way where I actually seeing the, that level of arts practitioner working and being a part of them working 
gave me an appreciation when you walk around an art museum just how almost, you know, how amazing it is, all the artists were that, that made the paintings. Because a lot of times we see the paintings as artifacts, you know, but like actually kind of trying to imagine that process that resulted in that, that piece is, is really fascinating. And actually via this very fortunate connection I've had with the art museum, I was able to get a whole new kind of optics on that whole process and what it looks like and feels like. And I guess for me as a person who, who makes things or as, as, a, as a producer, something that just that's always from, from museums cause, you know, it's not worth comparing yourself to anything you see in a museum. I think like each, each of the artists who puts things in a museum, they're working around, there's kind of a very extreme specificity to what they're doing. They're kind of like, in some ways, if you, if you zoom out and look at the whole project of art history, they're kind of instantiating specific moments in our intellectual development as civilizations and cultures, and then they're sort of encapsulating you know, kind of like a predominant way of thinking or doing or kind of like a, a cultural idiom of, of that moment. So in some ways, like, what I, when I see that, when I see great works of art in, in museums, um, I guess for me as a practitioner, rather than let that, like, intimidate me, what it pushes me to do is to look even more deeply into the idiosyncrasies of my own time, of my own culture, of my own place, and to kind of drill down and keep digging and digging and digging and understanding, you know, who who I am and who the people are around me in our unique idiom, I guess. Is that? Yeah, and I, I think that's <laughs> a, that's a really great way of thinking about how to kind of flip the script. Like, there's this mm -hmm. stereotype of museums being intimidating, and they absolutely can be intimidating, but I like that kind of... Um, tactic of saying, you know what, I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm just going to dive in and use it and flip it and kind of say, like, I'm just going to dig deep and try to find everything I can and connect it with myself. And that's something we've been really doing a lot in this course is finding ways to personally connect to works of art to kind of make all those different things happen. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Mary. Um, and Mary asks, uh, you both mentioned art therapy. What exactly does that entail? So maybe you guys could talk a little bit uh, more about um, your connections with art therapy. Sure, I'll, I'll go first since my mic's already on. You just, all right. Um, so art therapy, um, my mother, Janet Carr, when I was in preschool, I used to go with her out to Mount Mary College in Milwaukee and she was getting her master's in art therapy. And what, and I remember the, those kinds of experiences. And my mother's also a registered nurse, so in her practice of art therapy, it ranged everything from kind of like one-on-one uh, -on -one with more of a focus on therapy for an individual, where it's more kind of on a, on a clinical level, to community arts, where it could be more so about um, specific communities or slices of communities coming together to make something as a group kind of in a, in a process of exploring and perhaps, you know, articulating identity, those kinds of things. So, you know, art therapy, there's a lot of, you know, there's a pretty strong art therapy program at Mount Mary. There's, um, it's, it definitely seems to be a field that's growing, um, but it really has a, a lot of different, um, a lot of different instantiations of the way people do it, ranging from, you know, it can be someone who is a therapist and, and working with patients, but it can also be something that exists kind of in the spaces that Express Yourself Milwaukee does it, in alternative schools, in juvenile detention centers, and th those kinds of situations. Um, but it is a very, it, you know, it's, it's a way of connecting people and communities with the act of self-expression um, and kind of teasing out it, its therapeutic qualities, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, I... Um... Lori Vance, who's the executive director of Express Yourself Milwaukee. Uh, I guess she, you know, taught at Mount Mary's art therapy program for a while. Uh, there, she, she taught my mother. That was a uh, when I would go to Mount Mary, my mom was taking classes with Lori Vance. So oh, Milwaukee's a small city. Yeah. Small Milwaukee. And we say. Uh, and there's you know there's there's music therapy, there's art therapy, there's drama therapy. Uh, all of them using uh, using the arts as a way, <clears throat> as Adam mentioned, to you know for their therapeutic qualities. Uh, there's a woman at UWM named Ann Bastings who uses a process called you know time slips, 
and it's you know working with uh, elderly patients, I believe, with uh, dementia to um, to bring back memories or help them tell you know help them tell stories uh, and that sort of thing. So you know it can be as a, it can be a community based thing. Uh, you know there's group therapies even if it's not art therapy, but then there's also like Adam said, the individual practices, and I think particularly when dealing with youth, uh, they don't always have the vocabulary to say exactly how they feel or what's going on. Maybe they don't have vocabulary. Maybe they don't necessarily understand. But you know, art is a way to um, you know to get some of that some of that expression out and to uh, maybe even help a therapist understand where this uh, patient is really coming from without them saying it directly. Great, thank you. And that's a great question too. I think um, something that's come through with uh, a lot of these conversations is also how many careers uh, make use of arts and different types of arts, as you said, not just visual art, but drama, music, um, dance even, uh, all of which, you know, can be touched on in so many different fields and disciplines in so many different ways. So um, art therapy is a great example of one of those fields. Um, so we're nearing the end of our time together. Uh, as usual, the conversations zip by. Um, but I wanted to ask you all, one thing we're making sure to ask all of our speakers um, before uh, we end is how you go to museums. Um, specifically, you know, do you like to go alone? Uh, do you like to go with a group? Do you come at it with a specific list of things to see? Do you like to wander? Um, just to give our participants some more ideas about how to visit cultural institutions or galleries. I will, uh, I'll start. I, when I go to a museum, I like to have lots of time. Um, and depending on, you know, which museum it is, if I know the Milwaukee Art Museum, I know I can go back if I don't get to see everything I see that day. But I can make a day out of going to a museum I've never been to before. Uh, ideally, I will go with someone who is also interested in going to the museum, so it's not like pulling teeth, and someone who, you know, I don't know, I guess has a, a strong aesthetic sense or, uh, you know, um, a, a strong his, historical basis or something so that we can both, like, educate each other uh, about not even necessarily the pieces themselves, but just uh, what the pieces evoke in us, what they remind us of, uh, and just really making it more than just looking at pieces of art, but, you know, sort of like an, an experience. But I also like to go by myself and uh, to bring my sketchbook, sit in front of a piece of art and, uh, you know, recreate it or draw it or um, just be inspired by it. Fantastic. And I love the idea of going with someone who... You can, so you can not only learn about the art or about something at the museum, but learn from the other person. I love that idea. Adam? Can, we, can the three yeah. of us go to the museum? Or to, sorry, the museum. We live in Milwaukee. <laughs> I'm super provincial, so when I say the museum, I mean the Milwaukee Art Museum is what I mean. Yeah, so. come on and over any time, guys. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm actually serious about this. Sounds good. Okay. You in? I'm here all the time, so okay. just let me know when you arrive. <laughs> I'm serious. That might be cool. Maybe we could do like a program out of it. Like, cool. actually, that might be cool. Like tours with you for youngisher folks. That like, I would totally. That'd be really fun. I'm into it. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> we'll work uh, it into Ma'am After Dark, which is our uh, late night program. <laughs> no, let's not do that. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> so here's here's why. Um, so by suggestion of Lisa Sutcliffe, curator of photography at Milwaukee Art Museum, where when I was in, involved in the um, Postcards for America project, she suggested uh, on a trip to San Francisco that I see Pier 24, which is Pier 24 is a museum in San Francisco. It's an old, um, on the pier, it's one of the old kind of warehousing buildings there. The, and the entire uh, building has been converted into a um, gallery for photography. And it's very, very limited who can come in, like that you have to do it by appointment. And at any given time, I think there's like a dozen people in this massive space. So it is actually, it, I, I went to it, and it was pretty incredible. It's silent in there. 
Um, you, I only saw a couple other people the whole time, and it's a big, beautiful gallery of photography, and a lot of the photos are really large scale. So it was, it really was about kind of communing with the artwork, and I really appreciated it. And the reason I didn't want to do it at Mam After Dark is I think when other people are around, especially if they're drinking, especially if they're engaging with themselves and in a social context, I think that ruins the ability to engage with art. I think for me at least. Like I, it's not, you know, it's not so like uh, on and off that either I'm in the mood to engage with art or not. But I do find when there's too much social interaction, there's too much, cons like, you know, if I'm thinking about what my hair looks like, I'm not going to be doing a good job of looking at and engaging with and in, in kind of this engrossing experience of being in the art, you know. So I think, to me, I like going either by myself or, as Anwar said, with other people who are also engaging um, as kind of an active experience. And then also, I mean, the other, the other thing that I always do whenever I'm in an art gallery is just uh, reading wall tags, reading all the historical context, um, that I can because those are the things that, you know, I, I respect the act of curating and curators so much. A lot of times they can have this incredible way of shaping your experience and I find that to be um, always worth it, you know, to kind of, there's been so much painstaking effort put into what those wall tags say that I, um, I just, I, I always go to them first almost. I have to actually like tell myself to look at the art before reading the text sometimes just because of how um, important I think that that context is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think to your point about like the social aspect of museums too, like to me that's kind of the beauty of what museums can be in the 21st century, that there are times when you can have this kind of quieter experience. There are times when you can go with a big group of people and have it be more celebratory. Like I think there's there it's not an either or thing. It's like a wonderful both and nowadays that's really exciting but um, but definitely I am absolutely a proponent of close and quiet looking at a mm -hmm. work of art so um, absolutely to take the challenge to like try both try both out um, and, and, I, and I, I oftentimes think of like ma'am after dark or other celebratory experiences inside of a inside of museums and galleries and exhibitions to be almost more as a lure to get people into the space mm -hmm. to want to come back later if you ever go to one of, if you ever go to like some party in a museum, and I know those are happening around the country, that's great. And you, but I think what you're really getting there is an inadequate right. appetizer that mm -hmm. hopefully will whet your appetite enough that you'll go back and like order a meal, I guess, and absolutely maybe indulge in the banquet of art. <laughs> Keep going with that metaphor. How <laughs> much for that? Um, <laughs> And then, like Actually, Johnny, don't Cash, go further because we should end soon. Spill your cup of wine all over the banquet. That's what you should do. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> awesome. Know. Well, thank you guys both so much. I'm gonna wrap up our conversation because it is um, at our hour-long mark for our hangout. Um, but again, thank you both so much for being here today um, for this conversation about art and culture. I think we could probably keep have kept going for another hour. There's lots to say. Mm -hmm. um, but I encourage everyone to keep these conversations going, you know, bring up some of these questions when you next go to a museum, um, whether at a party or for quiet looking, either way. Um, and uh, keep the conversation going as well um, using our hashtag on Twitter if you want to keep uh, engaging. It's Hangout with Art. Uh, and please do join us next week for our fifth of the Hangout series. There will be six total, so we're nearing the end. Uh, and next week we will be featuring Dr. Jackie Erland, um, who uses art in her um, medical practice. So we're excited to have her. Um, but Adam and Anwar, thank you again so much for being here today and thank you all for tuning in as well. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.